I'm Alan Ross. I'm here at the IEEE PESTND, that's a lot of acronyms, conference. This is the 2020 version that is actually being held in 2022. These interviews that we're conducting is with thought leaders on the future of the power industry. So enjoy. Our next guest is a friend and a brother in, in combat here at all of the things that we're doing at IEEE, Ben Lance. Ben, thank you so much for joining us. Good to be with you, Alan. Now, I call Ben the guru of, of cable stuff. Now, he said, no, I have a title. And my <laughs> title is, what is your title exactly? Uh, with which organization? You tell me. Uh, you oh, tell me. Which PDI is... squared. I'm uh -huh. the chair of the board. Right. Um, and with MCorp, I'm director of strategy and development. See, I love that. See, I can't remember all that, sure. but we're going to talk about both of those. Sure. But before we get to those, I really want to, um, I respect you as a thought leader for the industry. There's a lot going on in, in the power industry right now. Um, just give me your perspective, put on your visionary hat, take your crystal ball out. Mm. What are some of the great challenges, great opportunities, the things that we're looking at that that as an industry, we really need to start addressing, but uh, put your thinking cap on. Sure, so from my perspective, the grid resiliency and electrification are really some of the biggest challenges oh, you and opportunities. You hit the two big ones right off the bat. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this, interview, this interview is gonna take about two hours because you just <laughs> hit two of the big issues. No, we're gonna talk about both of those. Mm -hmm. um, but when you said the, the electrification transportation, right? Right. People have said that, mm. but why is it going to be a problem? Why is it, it's an opportunity? We know that, right? But give me your perspective of what we're going to see as we start to deal with the electrification and transportation. Electrification is going to create a scenario where electricity is going to be just as important as food and water. We're not going to be able to have a society or live without electricity yeah. in our modern society. If we can't get someplace, if we can't uh, go get food and water. Yeah, if we can't yeah. transport that food yeah. and water uh, because it's all based on electric economy, yeah. uh, we need to make sure that it's resilient and reliable. And our grid is good at being, on average, very reliable, but to high impact, low probability scenarios where yeah. we have large uh, environmental you know, wildfires and hurricanes and ice storms our grid does not handle that very well. No, it doesn't. Resiliency is a huge problem. As you can see in the background, somebody's trying to break something. However, the good news is it doesn't show up very much on these things. <laughs> we had a band come through, Ben. No uh, but you remember, did you hear the... the oh, band. sure. It's they the walked ones. right it's by us and we didn't miss a beat. We went right through with the interview, so sure. we'll get through on that. Um, resiliency, it, to, to me, resiliency is Reliability is making sure it stays on. Right. Resiliency is knowing that it won't because we're having weather events. We're having all kinds of things happening. How quickly can you bring it back up? How right. quickly can resilient, can right. it withstand these things and survive? Talk a little bit more about how, how the cable, because you're, you're my cable guru, right. right? At APC Media, you're the technical advisory board guru for that. But talk a little bit about the problems that we've got with overhead, underground, I mean, you hear all kinds right. of things, but address that from a resiliency perspective. Sure. So, if I put my PDI squared hat on, Power okay. Delivery Intelligence Initiative, right. we're a think tank, we're a consortium that are disseminating best practices in transmission and distribution. Okay. Uh, what we see is that there's an obvious reason for people to install overhead lines. It, the upfront cost is low, and it's what we're used to. Yeah. However, the life cycle cost is what we need to be looking at, and that's much more uh, nuanced and much, much more uh, less understood. Right. We need to disseminate tools and information to the industry so that people can make better choices where underground makes sense. Uh, and in fact, uh, there's a panel session here today about strategic underground, and utilities are going to talk about their experiences. And if you look at electrification and think about resiliency, if you want a resilient grid, where you're going to be able to drive your car the day of the storm or after the storm. <laughs> to get out of the storm. To get right? out of the storm, yeah. then you need a resilient grid. Yeah. Uh, even microgrids right now. Uh, people have wonderful ideas about microgrids, but they can't cite 
the rotating uh, equipment, such as generators, yeah. and the large fuel depots that they need. Yeah. So they're not happening. And one of the one of the thought leadership ideas that coming out of PDI squared is, well, why not run an underground transmission line to that one microgrid area, off the grid some, from someplace else, yeah. and now that area can be island and have the stability of of the grid, and yet that individual area is is able to withstand a high impact, low probability event. So ultimately. Um, when we are demanding, or when we're you know, after COVID, we're, so many of us are relying on electricity just to do our job. Right. What happens when the power goes out and you can't access your laptop? Yeah. Many of us just can't even hardly do our job. Yeah. Uh, so resiliency um, is incredibly important. First responders, they need to have power that can survive. Um, extreme Absolutely. circumstances. And more and more of us are living near the coast, or near the wildfires. We're in high risk areas yeah. where we've never lived before. And we need to be able to protect ourselves. I want to switch. Sure. I want to go back to PDI squared. Sure. Um, it's a consortium. It's a think tank. Right. Who are the members that you're the chair? Who right. are the members of that? Right. It's a rotating chairmanship. Okay. Uh, but we have uh, material suppliers like Dow and Borealis. They're supplying uh, materials for insulating components. We've got uh, um, contracting organizations like Quanta and Century. We've got consultants like Burns and McDonald. Uh, we've got cable manufacturers, overhead and underground. So these people have okay. both materials. That's like Prismian and Southwire, some of the big names there. Um, so it's uh, folks that have technologies like sentient line sensors. Right. Uh, and, of course, the com another company that I'm associated with, Imcorp, that can provide uh, basically the MRI of underground power cable to be able to detect microscopic defects before they fail. And really what we're finding with PDI squared is there's two major setbacks. One uh, for undergrounding is the cost, upfront cost, and the fear of the unknown. If it's underground, <laughs> you can't drive by it and see yes, the problem. That's right, that's right. And when it fails, it takes longer to reinstall. So how do you eliminate that fear? It's through technology. Yeah. Technology is going to give us the ability to identify issues before or during installation, so we're not going to have those future O&M costs. Yeah. And when they do happen, we're going to have sensors that help us find the faults much quicker. Of course, we all know, too, that underground suffers from the water problems, because water and underground cable, there's a big... Right? Isn't that the conventional <laughs> wisdom? No. It's, oh, did I set it's, you up or it's what? It's a myth. It's a myth. <laughs> uh, yeah. Actually, water doesn't fail. Cable people do. Oh, I love that one. That's a snippet. We're humans. Yeah. We're humans and we make mistakes. 95% yeah. of cable system failures are associated with human contact or some kind of mechanical thing that we set up that wasn't supported. Right. Um, so the reality is if we can eliminate the the mechanical, the human aspect of, of uh, installing and maintaining cable systems, uh, they're very reliable. In yeah. fact, they can last well over 100 years. People say, oh, 20, 30 years. That's because we mistreat them and we abuse them during their operations. Shame on yes. people. I can't believe that. Unknowingly. <laughs> Nobody goes know, home at night uh, with uh, the thought of abusing I have to systems. tell you a quick aside. I think I've told you this before. We were doing something with a major paper company and they kept having uh, their prime, four primary sub uh, uh, transformers in one major sub, and they kept having failure problems. They couldn't figure out what the problem was. Well, we found out that it wasn't the transformer, it was the cable. They had seven cable splices that wasn't on the one line, and I guess one of them had been this constantly creating this problem. It unfortunately happened to be under a corner of the building of land that they had sold <laughs> that somebody else had built a building on. It's like, okay, so what happens when somebody builds a, a, a building over your, your cable, your direct feed? Well, obviously there's going to be It's error. Cases. It's human errors. But human error answer. in yeah. design and right. planning. Uh, this is what actually uh, the industry does well. We do planning well. Yeah. The, the industry is planning usually for failure you know yeah right? we're true. very good firemen in our industry oh, yeah. we run after the fire very well um, what we need to do um, more of um, is is planning and predictive work and uh, eliminating risk right and we can do that we can lower the cost in fact the cost of undergrounding is coming down through the use of technology um, uh, and isn't it also scale once we get I mean, there's the construction cost of underground sure. that tends to be the, but I think fires and, and what, we had 20 
major storms uh, in the last couple of years annually where we've normally usually had seven. Now, we've had some major storms. That's not going away. This is not a short-term phenomena. Um, we've been involved with, I say we, a group of us have been involved to review the Department of Energy's uh, multi-billion dollar spend in Puerto Rico to rebuild the Puerto Rico grid. Right. By the way, we were working on it three, four years ago. It still isn't rebuilt. But you know what they were gonna do? All of the towers that bring the transmission lines, they were gonna rebuild them. They were gonna build back different than the thing that continues to fail them. And I, I was in a meeting and I said, can I ask a question? Do you think Puerto Rico is ever gonna have another hurricane? And the idea was, interestingly enough, and the Department of Energy supported microgrids and underground. And then that way you avoid, so number one, you don't have big generation sending it across all the mountains. Right. Um, and it's not the cities that were the problem, it typically is that, but that was an interesting discussion to see the billions of dollars that the feds were going to spend on, on doing the same thing that we've always done, and I think that's right. to your point. Well, and we don't need to go to Puerto Rico. We have our own cases here in the United States where... Where uh, Puerto Rico is the United States. I, I, I know, and the mainland, I know. I'm saying. I got we don't you. have to go very far from right. our, our hometowns. Right. Uh, don't have to go across any stretch of ocean, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, to see where there are utilities that have had numerous overhead lines that yeah. failed you know, five, within the five, last five to ten years. They were rebuilt, and they all failed again. Now, imagine if just one of those lines was under. We're not saying everything needs to be undergrounded. But the opportunity for underground, from a life cycle standpoint, underground, say, compared to, say, wood pole structures, can yeah. last two to three times longer. Oh, That's, okay. that's the yeah. new materials and yeah. the science. It, it can... It's ten, at least 10 times more reliable. But the data just shows that on yeah, average. Yeah. And when you say it's 10 times more reliable, that's 10 times less operating and maintenance costs. Yeah. And the utilities typically have a hurdle of operating versus um, capital costs. Right. If you can take all of that operating and maintenance costs that we would have had to pay to maintain those overhead lines and fold that into capital, there's usually a 5 to 10x in, um, hurdle for that right. uh, capital improvement. So. A huge opportunity there. And then if you think about, what if, what if you had 10 times less truck rolls? You know, the, oh, the wow. most yeah. dangerous yeah. thing for yeah, utilities to do is to drive their truck out of the lot, right? right? If you have that many less truck rolls because you have that fewer, your safety goes up. So safety, reliability, the life cycle costs, we're not saying it works everywhere, but we're saying that we need it as an industry for resilience and for electrification to really be what it can be we need to be thinking about underground in more places. So it's interesting, you said PDI squared has both overhead and underground. You've got, a, a, so it's it's not one or the other, no. it's use the, the one that fits. That's I right. mean, if you're running a line, you know, 22 miles out to one farm somewhere, you're not right. gonna build underground for that, right? You're gonna run a line. Right, if that's what makes sense, and you can afford the risk. You know, if you know that you're in a path of, of, of high risk for yeah. overhead that's going to be destroyed in the next storm, uh, yeah, you might want to consider that if you're planning to be there for a while um, and if you just want to make the investment once. But those are decisions that need to be made locally. You know, yeah. We're not going to yeah. have a, a, a top-down approach and say everybody needs to do it a certain way. Right. We need to look at the individual cases. And PDI2.org or PDI squared uh, We're still struggling with that, and well, some of us want to do When I describe PDIs. it with the website, people don't understand it, so I, I try to make sure it's, it's yeah. clear. But um, at our website, we have tools and explanations and utility Excellent. case studies that show where it's worked so that people can mimic best practices. Is it a .com or .org? .org. PDI2.org. PDI2.org. Okay. PDI squared for some people. Okay, sure. for some people. But then somebody will write out squared and they'll go, it's not working. That's right. Man. I can't find it right. on the web. I want to switch gears a little sure. bit. Um, I know you've been involved with IEEE for a long, long time. And this is an IEEE event and this is an IEEE uh, content. Um, talk a little bit about the value that you've seen in your personal life, mm, in your right. career, that you've gotten out of IEEE and, and the value that that um, you bring to IEEE because it's a two sides of the same coin. Right, right. So I joined PD, uh, IEEE when I was in college 
In fact, it was uh, one of my technical mentors that said, yeah, you should join. I had no idea what the organization was. They said, I, I thought maybe some, I could get books and publications at a cheaper rate or something. Right, right, I, I didn't right. know. I went to one presentation at the University of Connecticut. How long ago was this? Uh, a little over 25 years ago. Wow, okay. So uh, I attended and I thought, oh, this is interesting information. But what I didn't realize and of course, I realize now that uh, it's, it's a basic truth that we understand that business is based on trust and uh, on trusting relationships. And the opportunity to meet some of the great minds in our area and have the opportunity to sit down with people who have long passed now. Yeah. That, that yeah. people, the, the giants in our space, um, the Bruce Bernsteins and the Bill Tuies, and these are people who are. I Triple E Life Fellows, Matt Mishikian, my personal technical mentor, yeah. um, who is uh, 86 now. He, he, a wealth of information. These are I Triple E Fellows. These are people I looked up to yeah. and learned from, and they were so giving. And these were trusting relationships that I built that were that helped me understand things technically, um, and inspired me to do the same for others. And then, even just from a business standpoint, those trusting relationships, there's nothing like a trusting yeah, relationship that's right. where you can get uh, to have really mutually beneficial opportunities. So the opportunity to grow my career uh, and my level of expertise, uh, the opportunity to be helped and to help others. So that basic human need um, and value of being able to connect yeah. with others and build something better than just one individual. And, and I've found that working in the trenches with people is one of the best ways to build a trusting relationship, yeah, right? right. Uh, so, you know, that's kind of a, a military uh, analogy, but working on standards is kind of like working together. Whether you're on one side or the other, yeah. uh, there's people who I've passionately disagreed with, but we're friends. Yeah. We're friends, and that's not going to change, and that's how I think how you create a, a better industry. <laughs> And Good morning. Better Welcome world. to the I Triple ESC Hold on just a second. conference. The show floor is now open. So we are at the PEST and D conference, and the show floor is now open. But that's great. Um, one of the things that you just hit upon. Somebody asked me one time, "Why does it take so long for a committee of I Triple E to come out with a standard mm. or to update a standard or anything?" And you just well, first of all, it's collaboration. Mm. Collaboration takes time. There's no one driving force. There's a common goal is what we're trying to come out with, the standard. And uh, I was interviewing somebody earlier, and um, they, they said, you know, no one ever got fired from buying from IBM. And I thought, eh, I have no people to get fired from buying from. But it's not about IBM. You really, the level of trust that industry had from following an IEEE standard, that's why it takes so long, because we got to get it right. Right. I don't know that there's too many IEEE standards that we ever said, oops, made a mistake on that, right? Right. So it, I would say we've, uh, it's sometimes the lowest common denominator, yeah. right, that we can all agree on, but yeah. that's a good place to start. That is a good <laughs> place to start. And then you lose a, a few of the naysayers and you bring some new papers and say, now this is what we well, have. Especially as great. the industry matures yeah. around a certain subject matter, right. more data comes in and it's, it's less... Uh, theory and more practical experience that drives the standard. So you need to get to an, a PDI-2, a PDI-squared, a PDI-2 is dot .org, right. and a PDI-squared is what some of us would like you to call it. Sure. You need to get to a panel session on that. But thank you for everything you do for IEEE and with IEEE. Thank you for what you do with APC Media, being on our technical advisory board, and uh, much luck and success. Thank you, Alan. Ben, appreciate it. You're welcome.